Okay, so we have now <clears throat> all of the pieces in place to start building Hobbes' account of justice and the commonwealth, arguably morality as well. So we've seen, first of all, his subjectivism about value. We've seen his account of how disputes, the only way disputes can be resolved. We've seen his instrumentalism about rationality. We've seen his, um, we've seen him say that human beings have a second order desire to acquire power, which just means that we know we will have, we know that we will have new desires in the future that we will want to satisfy. And therefore, we want to acquire means to be able to satisfy a wide variety of desires that we may come to have in the future. That's what power is. Let me see if there are questions about any of that. So we left last time <clears throat> with me sort of gesturing toward this great passage that I do want to read to you on page 61. So this is chapter 11, paragraph 21. So here Hobbes is on the basis of the points that I just made, Hobbes is now saying that we are able to use reason to construct a proper account of um, moral likeness. So he says, and he says, and if we don't rely on proper reasoning, well then things will be kind of a mess. So look 21, he says, ignorance of the causes and original constitution of right, equity, law, and justice. That is, so if we don't know, we don't have a proper understanding, a right and proper understanding of what the idea of right, equity, law, and justice are. We don't have a proper understanding of them. This will dispose a man to make custom and example the rule of his actions. Uh, so if we don't reason through, we're just going to rely on the way things have been in such a manner as to think that unjust which it hath been the custom to punish, and that just of the impunity and approbation whereof they can produce an example. Or as the lawyers, which only use this false measure of justice, barbarously call it, a precedent. And like little children, they have no other rule of good and evil manners but the correction they receive from their parents and masters, except that children are constant to their rule, whereas men are not so, because grown strong and stubborn, they appeal from custom to reason and from reason to custom as it serves their turn. Okay, so we need to really get to the bottom of this rather than in constantly relying on the things that we've inherited, like little children. Okay, so here we go. We're about to um, start building the positive case of law, equity, right, uh, and justice. And this is what he starts doing in chapter 13. So I'm going to go fairly slowly here. Uh, reading a bunch of these passages and commenting on them, you need to stop me if you have a question about them or um, don't understand what he's doing. All right, so right at the beginning, um, Hobbes is going to be describing the, well, look, uh, the title here of the natural condition of mankind as concerning their felicity and misery. So we're interested here in the natural condition of human beings. Uh, and natural here, of course, does not mean something like superior. 
natural here does not mean something like ideal. Natural means something like without constructed norms or rules or institutions. So we're to imagine what human life would be like without those kinds of constructed, chosen, made, built, selected arrangements. And this is what Hobbes calls the state of nature, our natural condition. Should I say again? And that means without the, sometimes he calls this artificial constructs. And again, that doesn't mean they're negative, that they're you know, cheap or plastic or something. Artificial just means constructive and artifice. And the state of nature is without that. Um, okay. And in this natural condition, he says we find a certain kind of natural equality. Look carefully now at exactly what kind of equality he's talking about. It says, nature hath made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind as that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another may not can also claim as well as this. For as to the strength of body, the weakest human has the strength enough to kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others that are in the same danger with himself. Okay, so the claim here of natural equality among human beings in the state of nature is one of something like approximately equal power. He's not saying we're all identical. He's not saying that. What he's saying is that when all of our powers are taken together, they're approximately equal. Um, so this is, uh, notice, an empirical claim. We could imagine some superhumans who are much more powerful than the rest of us. And the claim is that that's not the way it is, as a scientific matter of fact. Um, so I want to say again, so this is an empirical claim. It's not a moral claim. He's not saying that all human beings are of equal moral worth. This is a claim about our strengths and abilities, and they're pretty much on a level with one another. Um, the claim is not that everybody has equal moral worth, or even that everybody is of equal value. What's value determined by? How do we decide how valuable something a human person is? Right, so the, that's, that's the basis for valuing something, but how do we determine uh, value for I mean, so value is going to be always, always, always value for someone. So how do we determine what the value of someone for someone else is? What they're, what they're willing to pay. What they're willing to give up to acquire the means that that person represents. All right. So Hobbes' claim here is not that people are of equal value. Again, it's, of, it's a claim, it's an empirical claim of equal strength, equal mental um, And notice, notice really what this boils down to. Um, I mean, the, the case that he talks about, nobody's so much stronger than everybody else that they can ignore the threat, the possible threat that they represent, either individually or in groups. So really what Hobbes is saying here, the kind of equality that's an issue here is 
our vulnerability. Really what he's saying here is something close to we're all mortal. We all are at risk of dying, and in particular, at risk of being killed by other people. So nobody is so much more powerful than everybody else that they're invulnerable. Nobody's so much more powerful than everybody else that they can ignore the potential threat that they represent to their lives. That's the sense in which we are naturally evil. Say that one more time. We could imagine that somebody is so much more powerful than everybody else that they can ignore their threats. Hobbes is denying that. That's the sense in which we're equal. Not, this, not that we're equally strong or exactly equally intelligent. We're all equally vulnerable to one another. And this is true not only in terms of physical strength, as says in the next paragraph, but also in our um, mental abilities. Um, we all, um, I mean, it's a kind of nice passage. It says we're all, um, we all think that we ourselves are wiser or wittier than everybody else. This is an illusion, and what it in fact shows is that we're all pretty much equal to everybody else, because everybody thinks that. Um, okay, so approximately equal power, and the key here is equal vulnerability. Approximately <coughs> equal vulnerability. <coughs> Paragraph three, then, he says, from this equality of ability, actually, let me see, make one other point. Um, notice uh, how very far this assumption of natural equality is from anything resembling, like, divine right theory. Nobody, nobody, is naturally chosen by God, for example, to rule over everyone 